Thursday morning. Um, uh, this morning we have three uh, loosely related talks. I know. <laughs> um, so uh, first up is uh, Will Perkins, and you not included your title. On I have. Way right over here. Uh, Add chat poly models in the cluster. So. Great, thanks. Okay, right, thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, and. Thanks to organizers for a really good semester and a really good workshop. It's been a lot of fun. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, some algorithms that you can derive from some classical statistical physics tools. Uh, but I wanted to start, uh, before getting into my talk, just by showing a couple of simulations. And so the, the running example I'll be using today is just the ferromagnetic POTS model. Uh, so I wrote the partition function here, sum over all Q, Q colorings of a graph, uh, e to the minus beta times the number of uh, uh, bichromatic edges induced by this coloring. So the, just the classical uh, ferromagnetic <coughs> POTS model. The simulation you'll see is a um, three color POTS model on some sort of 2D torus. Um, okay, I started all pink. Um, and as we run these, uh, so this is Glauber dynamics uh, sort of batched together. Uh, making little updates, and quite quickly you see that uh, somehow the picture looks quite disordered. Um, okay, so that maybe that's not so surprising. Beta is small here. Uh, let me change the parameter of beta to something larger, uh, and the picture looks a lot different. Okay, so uh, we have this sea of pink, and we have these small little islands of blue and white that uh, sort of are born and die, grow a little bit. Uh, but there's clearly something very different going on here. Uh, I think everyone knows uh, here knows that this is, this is some finite evidence of a phase transition. And so this, the Glauber dynamics uh, is having a very hard time getting away from this all pink configuration and getting, you know, there's symmetry in the model, ideally you would also be seeing a blue dominant phase, a white dominant phase. Uh, and so, I mean, you know, this is, this is a theorem that uh, on, say, ZD, uh, for large enough beta, there is a phase transition, there's slow mixing, uh, and things like this. Now, um, and so the Markov chain uh, Glauber dynamics is not a good sampling algorithm uh, <coughs> for this particular graph and these particular parameters. Uh, and now, if, probably if you've ever heard someone say that, your first reaction and my first reaction is, come on, you know, just, just symmetrize between the states. It doesn't actually seem like a barrier. Uh, and, and somehow this picture actually looks simpler than the other picture. You know, this is like a lot of pink and then some small defects. Okay, and then, so my whole talk today is how do you make such an idea rigorous? How, how can you um, actually say that uh, it's enough to symmetrize between the states. Uh, maybe not use a Markov chain, but use some other algorithm and really make rigorous the idea that th this looks simpler than the other picture. Okay, and so that's, that's what we'll do. Um, that's all for the simulation. Um, okay, so let, let's start. Um, and let me tell you what I'll, I'll be talking about. So, um, sort of, the, the talk will go in reverse historical order. So I'll tell you a result uh, about expander graphs from a paper of mine with uh, Matthew Jensen and Peter Kibosh. Uh, but somehow the key algorithmic idea comes from a paper, an earlier paper uh, with Tyler Helmuth, who's here, and Hus Rex. Uh, and, and this paper was really inspired by uh, you know, the method of Barvenak and Patel Rex. Um, but the actual algorithm isn't their algorithm. The algorithm actually comes from some classical statistical physics. So, uh, the Meyer expansion or the cluster expansion, uh, pirogov sinai theory, you'll hear more about later today, Zarodnik's version of this. Uh, there's lots and lots of work <coughs> in statistical physics on this cluster expansion. We'll, we'll use a particular theorem of Katetsky and Price. Um, but the point today is that actually in all of this work, there was uh, algorithm lurking and not, not so far below the surface. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you that algorithm today. Um, Okay, good. So I'll, I'll just give a few definitions. So we have the POTS model. Um, we have, uh, and our goal is going to be to approximate the partition function or to sample. Uh, what's an epsilon approximation? Uh, it's a value z hat. And I'll uh, just, I like this parameterization better so that this is at most e to the 
epsilon z and at least e to the minus epsilon z. Okay, so that's our goal. And fp tasks, we've seen this. Uh, we want to <coughs> compute an epsilon approximation in time uh, polynomial in n and 1 over epsilon. And uh, the class of graphs I'll talk about today is uh, expander graphs. And here's one notion of expander graphs. An alpha expander uh, is a graph uh, where the, the number of edges, so uh, partial E s is just the number of edges ex exiting a vertex set s, is at least uh, alpha times the size of s for all s that's, that is not too big. So let's say at most uh, n over 2. So n, n will always be the number of vertices of the graph. Uh, OK, so that's, this is a class of graphs we'll uh, talk about. And then uh, what's the theorem that I'll tell you? So the theorem, and this is uh, in this paper with Matthew Jensen and Peter Kibosh, uh, Let's say for all uh, q at least 2, delta at least 3, uh, beta at least I don't know, 4 log q delta over alpha, uh, there is an fp task and an efficient sampling algorithm uh, for the Potts model on alpha expanders. max degree delta. Okay, so that's, that's, that's the theorem. And notice that this is like a low temperature result. You know, usually the algorithms we hear, it's high temperature. If beta is small enough, if lambda is small enough in the hardcore model, here's the other, other extreme. If beta is large enough, if we're you know, far enough into this phase coexistence regime, then there's an efficient algorithm. OK. Um, so I want to start by just doing a, like a schematic picture. Um, so remember, we had the simulation. We had this big pink C and these little islands of other colors. So let's, let's draw that. So let's say we're mostly red. And then what, what else do we see? We're going to see some other small components. So maybe like a few green vertices, maybe a few green vertices, and a few blue vertices next to them. Maybe some, a blue component, maybe another blue and green component. Okay, and so let's say we have a configuration like this in our expander graph. Uh, I'm going to call these connected components of non-red vertices, I'll call them polymers. And, and I, I warn you already, this, this is somehow a bad, bad terminology because there's something else in statistical physics called a polymer. Um, but this is, this is historical. Um, OK, so this is gamma 3, gamma 4. Uh, OK, and so what properties do these uh, parameters, ha uh, these polymers have? Um, well, so gamma i is a connected subgraph. of non-red vertices. Um, that's one property. Uh, if you look at the, the distance between gamma i and gamma j for i not equal to j, this is at least two in the graph. Otherwise, they would form one connected component. Okay. Um, and then I'm going to define um, a function. I'll call it like the surface energy or something. Uh, so the surface energy of gamma i will just be the number of bichromatic edges uh, incident to gamma i. And so what do I mean there? So uh, remember, these are, these are a connected set of vertices. Certainly all the edges that leave this uh, polymer are bichromatic because they go to red vertices. 
But you might also inside have some bichromatic. So this counts all of these. OK, that's nice. And so, so right away, we can write this, that uh, for this particular configuration coloring sigma, e to the minus beta times the number of bichromatic edges <coughs> equals the product over these polymers, e to the minus beta times the surface energy. So this is, this is the weight of the POTS configuration in the POTS model. And I've just written it as a product over these uh, polymers. Okay. Um, that's nice. Um, and now what I can do is I'm going to define uh, a function, uh, kind of like a partition function, z red. Uh, uh, let me say, uh, let me add one thing. Uh, these are connected subgraphs with non-red vertices, and these are also small. So let's say they have at most uh, n over 2 vertices. So I want to add that. Uh, and in particular, since they're small, we know um, that the surface energy is at least alpha times the size, because it's an expanding graph. So at least you, these are all small vertex sets. And we have this expansion property, this definition of expansion. The number of edges going out is at least alpha times the size. And so we have some lower bound on this surface energy term. OK, and now I'm going to define z red to be the sum over all uh, collections of uh, compatible uh, polymers. I'll tell you what compatible is. Um, product over gamma and x, uh, e to the minus beta times the surface energy of x. So uh, compatible polymers, I just mean that uh, it's a collection of polymers whose distance is at least 2. OK. Uh, that's z red. Then we have a lemma. Uh, let's say for at least four log delta over alpha, um, Q times Z red is an e to the minus n approximation uh, of Z, uh, the real partition <coughs> function. So here I've defined some partition function that's supposed to represent uh, the configurations where you see mostly red in the C. And there's some symmetry among the colors. So if you multiply by Q, you get uh, some contribution from um, configurations where there's some dominant color. And what we're saying here is that actually this, this is a very, very good approximation of the real partition function. OK, so what, what is this really? This is really like a slow mixing result. Right? You've shown that there's some exponentially small cut in your state space. Um, and I guess it's a bit surprising, but somehow this slow mixing result is going to be a necessary uh, ingredient to find this efficient algorithm. But, but, it's, but we need more than this. So you know, when, you, when you're proving slow mixing, you just need to show that there's an exponentially small cut. You don't need to say that like, that's the only cut. And within the pieces, everything is nice. What we'll show next is that within these pieces, uh, like the configurations corresponding to z red, things are nice. So e to the negative n is a relative error, right? So yeah, multiplicative approximation. Within one plus e to the negative n. Yeah. So it's, it's really a good prox approximation. <coughs> really? Yeah. yeah. Because, I mean, e to the n appeared this conference and many other <laughs> Yeah, yeah, this is e to the minus n. Well, that's the same thing as e to the n, right? <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. um, so so uh, this is really about expanders, and it's not saying anything about lattices. No, you'll see later today Let about okay. lattices. Okay. So to do lattices, it's going to be much, much harder. Okay. Uh, this, this is the easy, the easy thing. <coughs> um, OK, good. So. Um, yeah, so any questions at this point? Uh, we're going to 
we're going to take a detour now away from the POTS model into some abstract setting. Um, and this is the idea of abstract polymer models. Polymer models. The terminology is due to Gruber and Coons from, I think, 72. Um, the Bruchin in the 90s tried to get people to adopt a different terminology because polymers mean something else, of animal models. And the, the terminology is actually quite uh, vivid, but it didn't catch on, unfortunately. Um, OK, so abstract polymer models. We have some graph G. Um, we have some set, uh, let's see, curly C of polymers, gamma. And gamma is a connected. So a polymer is a connected subgraph um, with uh, a spin assignment, maybe. Uh, and uh, a weight function. So each polymer comes with a weight function, w sub gamma. Uh, this could be real, complex, uh, anything you like. Uh, and there's a notion of compatibility. So um, we say gamma is compatible with gamma prime if in the graph in which they live, uh, the distance is at least two. Okay, so this should, should be familiar. Um, and then we can define a partition function. So z will be the sum over all uh, collections of compatible polymers. So mutually compatible polymers, product over uh, these polymers weight of gamma. So this is some abstract version of a, a partition function. Uh, notice that this partition function here I described fits exactly into this model. Um, an even simpler example is you have some graph G, and your polymers are just single, <laughs> single vertices. Okay? And the weight function of each vertex is just lambda. So what does it mean to sum over a, a collection of vertices that are pairwise compatible, distance at least two? This is summing over independent sets. So this is just the hardcore model, if, you're, if th these are your polymers. And so in some sense, uh, the abstract polymers are a way to map some general spin system into a hardcore model, which is uh, uh, quite a nice thing, I think. Um, you, you, turn the you put all the interaction into the weight function. And then all you have is the uh, hardcore uh, compatibility relation. Uh, OK, good. Um, right. And so uh, now what I want to tell you is uh, what is the cluster expansion. So we have, to, we have a few more definitions. Uh, so uh, let's say we have a tuple uh, capital gamma of polymers. Uh, so this is an ordered multi-set of polymers. So you might have like five copies of the same polymer in your tuple. Uh, H of gamma is its incompatibility graph. So it's, it's a graph with uh, vertices representing each polymer in the tuple and an edge if you're incompatible. So if your tuple, for example, is gamma 1, gamma 1, gamma 1, the incompatibility graph is a triangle, because you're always incompatible with yourself. Um, OK, I'll say uh, the size of a tuple is the sum over all the polymers in the tuple, uh, the size of the polymer, number of vertices in the subgraph. Um, I also need uh, a combinatorial function, so the Ursel function. graph, uh, h, is 1 over the number of vertices factorial, sum over all subsets of the edges. And these subsets have to be connected. What I mean by connected is if you take the vertex set of h and the set of edges a, this graph is connected. Okay, so you, have to, you, ha it's, you also have to be spanning. Uh, and minus 1 to the size of a. So this is some combinatorial function of a graph. 
the Earth cell function. It turns out it's uh, some evaluation of the Tut polynomial, where it's like the, the linear coefficient of the chromatic polynomial. Um, I, th I think it also has some other combinatorial uh, names. Okay, and so what is the cluster expansion? So the cluster expansion is going to be an infinite uh, series representation of log z. Um, and it's, at the moment, it's formal, just a formal power series. Um, what it actually is, it's, it's going to be the multivariate Taylor series for log z in the variables of the weight functions around zero. So you can, you can derive it this way. Uh, this somehow wasn't observed in, until many years later uh, by Debruchin. But uh, what is it? It's going to be the sum over all, oh, I, I should say one thing. Uh, Cluster. So what is a cluster? Uh, gamma is a cluster if uh, H of gamma is connected. So you just sum over all these tuples whose incompatibility graph is connected. You have this combinatorial factor, and then you just multiply the weights. So that's a cluster expansion. Notice that it's, it really is an infinite series because uh, a cluster could consist of k copies of the same polymer for any k. Uh, so it really is infinite. Um, I think in combinatorics has been known like, since ever, right? There's a relation between a generating function and an exponential generating function. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean. Which, I mean you know, diminish it. No, 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 I mean, but like... Uh, this has been known for a long, long time, too. Yeah, I mean, the fact that these are connected gives, like, for your Taylor series thing, a, a polynomial time algorithm. So, um, yeah, so it, it's useful. Uh, okay, so... Um, right, so this is just a formal power series, and then you can ask, when does it converge? Okay, and how fast does it converge? Uh, and so here, here we'll use a useful theorem. And so, so this, is, this is a very, very widely studied topic in statistical physics. When does this series converge? And I'm just going to give one like, convenient theorem. Uh, it's not, not the first or necessarily the sharpest, but it's convenient. So this is uh, by Kotetsky and Price. And the condition is if uh, for all polymers gamma, if you sum over uh, the polymers incompatible with gamma, uh, the absolute value of the weight, let's say e to the size, this should be less than the size of gamma. Okay, so this is the condition. Uh, and then the conclusion is that uh, cluster expansion converges, absolutely. And in particular, uh, the partition function is not zero. Um, okay, so so like one. W okay, one thing you, one thing you see immediately is what do you need? You need some sort of exponential decay of the weight functions uh, in the size. Okay, you need to kill off this exponential, but you also need to kill off this sum over all possible polymers. Um, I guess I should remark that what what did we really do here in this case? We we, we switched from, from low temperature to high temperature. When beta is large, so low temperature here, these weight functions get smaller and smaller. Okay, so that's, that's the whole idea of what we're doing, is with this abstract polymer model, we're switching from low temperature to high temperature. And this is saying, if your, your weights, uh, these weights in this uh, polymer model are small enough, so if beta is large enough, then this series converges. Uh, okay. So that's, that's good. Um, like yeah. Notation is this gamma prime incompatible with gamma. Right, so, so you have one polymer sitting in your graph. So this is gamma. And you need to sum over all the polymers that somehow touch it. 
So it includes, it includes itself, includes any polymer that shares a vertex, includes any polymer that's within distance one. It's adjacent in the incompatibility graph, yeah, exactly. Okay, so uh, this is a nice theorem. This, is used, this theorem is used, for example, by uh, Alan Sokol in proving something about the roots of the chromatic polynomial. Uh, so it's, it's, this is really a tool. It, you can think of it like a tool in combinatorics to sh prove zero-free regions of polynomials, uh, and it's quite useful. Um, for, if we want to study algorithms, we want to get a, a bit more control on the rate <coughs> of convergence, and so this is a uh, not too hard corollary of this theorem, which is suppose uh, for all uh, vertices in my graph, my underlying graph, if I sum over all the polymers that contain this particular vertex, and I look at the absolute value of the weight function, let's say e to twice the size of the polymer, uh, this is at most one over, if this graph has max degree delta, one over delta plus one, so a bit stronger condition, um, then what do we get? Um, we get some uh, good exponential decay of, uh, exponential convergence of this series. So I'll say uh, Tm, I'll define this in one second, Tm minus log z uh, in absolute value is at most n times e to the minus m. And what is Tm? So uh, Tm will just be the sum over all clusters whose size is at most m. And remember, this is the sum of the sizes of the polymers inside it. Uh, and then so this is just uh, the truncated uh, cluster expansion. And so if you have this stronger condition, what this is saying is uh, this uh, approximation gets uh, better quickly, and this implies that if uh, m is, let's say, log n over epsilon, then uh, exp of tm is an epsilon approximation to z. That's good. Um, so this suggests an algorithm. What do you do? Enumerate all clusters of size at most log n over epsilon. the Ursel functions. Compute the weight functions. Uh, multiply them up and add them up. And uh, output this. So that's the algorithm. It's just truncate this uh, cluster expansion. Um, why can we do this efficiently? So here we really, why can we enumerate clusters? So clusters are connected objects. <coughs> and G has bounded degree. So this is essentially enumerating some connected objects in some sort of bounded degree graph. Uh, it's a little bit subtle because you can have multiple polymers, um, but this is why you can do this efficiently. Uh, why can you compute the Ursel function efficiently? It turns out you can compute uh, the coefficients of the Tut polynomial uh, in vertex exponential time. This is not a super old result, right? This is from 2008, yeah. So it's by... Um, I mean, it's a bit surprising, I guess. 
by Bjorkland, Husfeldt, Kaski, and Koivisto from 2008. So vertex exponential time is enough because we just have uh, clusters of size log n. Um, in the examples I've shown, computing the weight functions is pretty trivial. Um, but in other applications, this might not be trivial. Uh, and then multiplying in some and output. Uh, OK, so uh, any questions about the algorithm? Um, and so somehow, somehow you know, the, hidden inside the derivation of the cluster expansion are these kind of Newton identities that Patel Rex used to uh, sh show that you can compute uh, these coefficients uh, efficiently. But that, that's somehow hidden in this derivation of the cluster expansion. So now we just need to prove the theorem. And so what we need to do is we need to check for this POTS model, uh, these POTS model polymers, that uh, this condition uh, here holds. So what do we need to do? We need to look at the sum over all uh, polymers containing a certain vertex. Uh, the weight function is e to the minus beta times the surface energy plus twice the size. Uh, OK, so this is, this is the thing we want to bound. Uh, this is at most uh, the sum. These. So now we use expansion. This is at most e to the minus beta uh, alpha times the size of polymer. Okay. And now, now we can sum over all possible sizes of the polymers. How many possible connected graphs labeled by q minus 1 colors are there? It's something like e delta q minus 1 to the k. And then we have e to the minus beta alpha minus 2 times k. OK, so this is some uh, exponential sum uh, in k. And we just need beta to be large enough. So this is less than, you can do the algebra, 1 over delta plus 1 if beta is at least, say, 4. Okay, so that, that's, that's the algorithm, um, or the proof. Um, right, and so what else can I tell you about this? So um, let me tell you a couple things. So this gives you an FP TAS for uh, this problem. Well, what about sampling? Sa sampling is a little bit subtle. So normally we think uh, sampling and counting uh, efficient counting or equivalent. Um, and what would you do? You would do some sort of self-reducibility. And so one thing you, would, you could, would try is spin by spin in this POTS model, set the spin to something, and then uh, go on. Um, so one, one problem that you might uh, consider in this case is, what if you ruin your expansion? Right? We had some expansion properties. And once you start to set boundary conditions, you can ruin this. So the sampling algorithm actually works. Uh, it's self-reducibility, but on the level of polymers. OK, so the idea is to. Uh, Pick a vertex uh, v and choose which, if any, uh, polymer gamma that contains v uh, is in the configuration x. Uh, and you do this by computing uh, partition functions or approximating partition functions. So you have, your, you have your big graph. You pick some vertex. And then what you want to decide is, is there no polymer that contains this? 
Is, th is it this polymer? Is it this polymer? And you have to go through all these polymers and check, you know, compute different partition functions and see with what probability uh, is a particular polymer there. Uh, and then you either add it or add nothing to your, the set that you're going to grow. And then what happens? You've added a polymer. Uh, you know no other polymer that contains V can be in the set. And you also know that this uh, nothing that is within distance 1 can be in the set. So you've taken your set of polymers and you remove a bunch of polymers that are now forbidden from being in the configuration. Um, and so you, you, you're left with some uh, set of polymers C prime uh, that's a subset of your original set of polymers. Um, and and one, one nice thing is that uh, in the setting of these abstract polymers in this Kotetsky price condition, um, if you have this condition holding for a set of polymers C, then it holds for any subset, right? Because the, the condition, uh, it's only easier to, to satisfy if you have less polymers, okay? So you can, you can do the entire algorithm uh, with any subset of polymers, whether or not this subset of polymers corresponds to a spin model or not, okay? So it's, uh, it's a little bit surprising, but some arbitrary subset of polymers won't necessarily con correspond to some spin system with boundary conditions, but you know the algorithm goes through uh, completely fine. So, uh, so on the graph level, you would say it's just an induced subgraph of the large, in, uh, large graph of which you're taking the independent. On the in th this graph of polymers, right. exactly. But, but wouldn't you have to go over potential, like exponential size? Ah, good, good. Ah, so, good. yeah, so. What does this imply in particular? So this implies in particular uh, that um, if you throw away all polymers that are of size bigger than log n over epsilon, Nothing it, it, that can, you can only lose epsilon in your partition function. Right? Because basically, uh, the contribution to the partition function of, of these, the, the subset of polymers of size at most log n over epsilon is a 1 minus epsilon approximation. <clears throat> so, if you throw them all, right, but what if you throw some of them? That's fine, because it's absolute convergence. So, I, I, I didn't state it as, as strong as it really is. The, it really says that if you sum over all the terms of the cluster expansion with each term absolute value. Oh, so, so you just triangle it, right? I see, okay. Yeah. To convergence. <laughs> yeah. Um, right, so you can, you can, this t immediately tells you you don't have any big polymers that matter. But I think, yeah, I'm sorry. To, yeah. So I think the interesting situation is then that somehow a higher order term somehow like cancel each other or something like that. And that happens from time to time, right? So that you can throw them all together or none of them, right? Yeah. But, I mean, this won't capture this. Um, Okay. Yeah. So I, I, yeah, maybe I'll make some related remarks uh, in the last five minutes. So um, good. So we we talked about sampling. Uh, yeah. So let me make a couple of remarks. Um, one is that I guess in statistical physics language, uh, the cluster expansion is a perturbative method, and you shouldn't ever expect it to be tight. And so you know we're always you know unlike something like Li Yang theorem or something like that, when you're looking for exact uh, regions. Here it's always going to be something like for something large enough, um, and that's that's just uh, something inherent in, in a method like this. Um, another thing is that uh, I said that the cluster expansion is the multivariate Taylor series in the weights, and so if your weight functions, like our weight functions in this POTS model, are uh, analytic functions in some other parameter, so our functions were polynomials in e to the minus beta. Uh, then actually the, the cluster expansion and the Taylor series are the same thing, okay? just organized differently. Um, but, but the caveat is that it's not always the case that the weight functions are analytic functions of some other parameter. Okay? And uh, Tyler will talk something about this, but the weight functions can get pretty nasty and maybe the weight functions themselves are not analytic. And so there is, there is a subtle difference between uh, the Taylor series approach and this approach. Um, Good, um, and then, yeah, and another, another remark is that if you have some condition like this, then somehow probabilistically you understand the model really, really well, 
So you can derive things like, uh, so certainly th somehow the model is analytic. You can derive things like exponential decay of correlations. So immediately from this, you get something like that the, the correlation between the presence of two polymers uh, decays exponentially in, the di in their distance. Uh, you can derive central limit theorems on like the number of patterns of certain types. <laughs> Uh, you can derive lots and lots of things like this. And this, uh, there's a survey by Debruchin, I guess, uh, lectures from like 1995, uh, where, he ha where he has this like animal model terminology, but he also talks about, uh, he's basically trying to encourage probabilists to use uh, the cluster expansion because you can derive lots of probabilistic information. So what we're saying here is actually, there's also a lot of algorithmic content. Uh, when you when you have this uh, strong condition, um, and then right, and I guess going going back to the original simulation, uh, what you really would like is just that like some local Markov chain can sample in this region. Uh, and this this is quite a, a difficult and not so fast algorithm, um, but really what you would like is. Uh, to be able to prove something about some local Markov chain, clearly not Glauber dynamics, but some local Markov chain to say that really that intuition that we all have when we first hear slow mixing that just symmetrize between the states, that's true. Uh, we still haven't shown that, uh, but at least we've shown that you can do something algorithmic. Okay, so I'll stop there. So I'm assuming the dependence on delta is exponential. So the, uh, yeah, so as I've stated it, the dependence is like uh, uh, n over epsilon to the log delta. Uh, if, you, if you have stronger, if you satisfy this in a stronger way, then you can reduce the running time. Um, um, I have the discrete n, the n dimensional cube in mind. So there you can do it like in, so the hypercube. Okay, yeah, so the, I'm, I'm doing something about the hypercube now, but there you can basically get a good approximation in a, almost no time, so sublinear. Yeah, so if you, have, if you have lots of expansion, the running time goes down a lot. But you still need to compute the top polynomial of these, um, these incompatibility graphs, right? Yeah, um, but the, the question is how many, ter how many terms do you need ah, so you to get a good approximation? It turns out in like the hypercube case, you just need a constant number. You don't need log n. Um, because there's a, much, there's a much more general theorem stated in the Katetsky price paper where you, you're allowed arbitrary functions up here. And then the, the, running, the decay depends on these functions. And there you can take a function that actually like, is much bigger as a, the size of the polymer. The hypercube is it's not formally speaking covered, right? By this, because it's not an expander, right? So right, so it doesn't have this much expansion, but it has enough expansion. Ah, it still can be. Yeah. So, uh, so David Galvin and Prasad have a paper about graphs like the hypercube slow mixing. So basically, if you can do slow mixing with like tweaking parameters a little bit, you can get an algorithm. I guess that's a bit strange, but. That's the Perkins philosophy. Yeah. It's a bit controversial, I guess. Any more questions? Okay. This is a. Um, 15 minute break um, and we'll reconvene at 10.30. Thanks again.